morning, CIL. It's good to see you this morning. Good to worship with you this morning, this second week of Advent, this second Sunday of Advent. I love that the church calendar doesn't just start right at Christmas, on Christmas Day, but gives us time to prepare our hearts as we get to Christmas. So last week would, is, would, would have been Happy New Year to you because it was the, the start of the new year in the, Christ, uh, the church calendar. And in the second week, as the world is counting down shopping days till Christmas, we count down something different. We uh, set our hearts differently. Advent is a time of waiting of anticipation, and if we pay attention, we can hear the longings of our own hearts through this time. If we pay attention, we can see God's kingdom as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. You know, Fleming Rutledge, who is a, a pastor and a writer, says this about Advent. It's where we live our lives the time between, between the incarnation of Christ, his death and resurrection that would change everything, that would inaugurate the kingdom of God on earth and his return when all will be made new and we will live in the fullness of new creation. So in this in in between, in this advent, how do we live? How do we find peace? in the time between. The text that we're going to use this morning, there's a lot of scripture, y'all. I'm just going to warn you up front. It comes from the lectionary. The lectionary is a three-year cycle of readings every day and on Sundays. And the beauty of it is that it takes a passage from the Old Testament and takes a psalm and takes a passage from the New Testament, from an epistle, from a letter, and a passage from the gospel. And as we read day by day and read those on Sunday, we're reminded that the whole of Scripture is the story of God's salvation. And and we see that in the Old Testament, and the thread wanders through generation after generation after generation through the birth of Christ and into the letters, into the New Testament. So I'm going to use the second Sunday of Advent scriptures from the lectionary today. The theme is peace, shalom, wholeness. All of God's creation reflecting God's ordering of the world he created. Peace between us and God, peace within ourselves, and peace between each other. Pastor Mauricio taught beautifully about peace in early October. If you didn't hear that, I would encourage you to go back and listen to his sermon as well. We're going to take a different perspective. We're going to look at at peace a little differently this morning. God's promise of salvation, of redemption, shows up early in our story. Early in our story. Genesis 3. Now, when God said to the serpent... I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This isn't God saying to human beings and to snakes, y'all aren't going to like each other. This is a promise of salvation and redemption that the offspring of a woman, Jesus, the son of God, would crush the head of the accuser. So early in our story, we get a promise of redemption and salvation. And it wanders through, like I said, through the generations, and we hear the prophets speak of it. That's who we're going to go to today. We're going to go to the prophet Isaiah. And in our Old Testament text, he paints a picture of God's kingdom. We're going to be in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. In earlier chapters in Isaiah, he has been speaking words of judgment to God's people, calling them back into faithful relationship with God, and then offering them a glimpse of what God's kingdom will be over and over, as all the prophets did, calling God's people back into faithful relationship. 
And now, here's his description of the kingdom. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of God will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears. But he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth, and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fatted lamb will be together, and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young ones will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit, and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain, for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. On that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will look to him for guidance, and his resting place will be glorious. The root of Jesse, a stump from Jesse. It's referring to David. Jesse was King David's father. And so we have in this prophecy that a descendant of David is going to be the king. And look at how he describes the king, the character he describes. Knowledge, wisdom, counsel, strength. And immediately after that, talks about the poor and the oppressed. The people who don't have a voice in power structures will be of particular care in this kingdom. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. His delight will be in him. He will have the spirit of wisdom and understanding, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears. This king doesn't judge on appearance by what, what surface things are. And he doesn't judge by what he hears other people saying but from the righteousness and the faithfulness of God, he will lead his people. I think it's interesting in here that he says, um, he will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth and will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Evil will be taken care of, not with conventional weapons, but by the word of the Lord and his breath. That will change things. That will change the world. The way we expect the world to work is turned upside down in this kingdom. Even this description of animals that we consider predators, right, will live with the prey. There will be no more murder. There will be no more harming each other. In fact, he says, none will harm or destroy another for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with the earth. This kingdom that Isaiah is talking about has been inaugurated. It's here. Jesus brought it. In his incarnation, his life, his death, resurrection, and ascension, he has done that. He has inaugurated the kingdom it's here. A kingdom, let's define it. A kingdom is wherever the rule of the king is proclaimed and lived, right? It's where the rule of the king is proclaimed and lived. 
it's a little bit of an, of an analogy, not a perfect one, but an analogy would be like um, an embassy from a country in another land. If, if you're somewhere outside of the borders of the United States and have some sort of issue, have some sort of problem, need some help, you would go to the US embassy in that country. And when you're in the embassy, it's like you're in the United States with all of the benefits and rights and responsibilities, that is the United States in that land. And it's just as though you were, you were back here in this room if you're in the embassy in another land. So if that's our definition of a kingdom, that it's the place where the rule of the king is proclaimed and lived, and Jesus has inaugurated this kingdom, how do we locate it today? Where is the kingdom of God today? Any audience participation? It is in us. We sang that song earlier, I give you my heart and you will reign forever. You are where the kingdom of God is if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And so as citizens in that kingdom where we proclaim his rule, how do we live? How do we live in the kingdom in this in-between time? When we don't fully see, when we're waiting and anticipating on the return of Christ to fully show us, to fully make things right, how do we live? We get, a, we get a hint from Isaiah in how, how we um, respond to the poor and the oppressed. It's evidence of the kingdom when we do that. So now let's, let's let this journey take us to a letter, to the epistle. Um, it's um, written by Paul to the church in Rome, the Church of Romans. I love in his letters, he is trying to create communities of faith that will last, that will stand the test of time, that will exist when he is gone. And so he writes these letters to help them understand what it means to live in the kingdom. And here's what he said in Romans 15, 4 through 13. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Therefore, welcome one another, just as Christ also welcomed you to the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the fathers, and so that Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing praise to your name. Again, it says, rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will appear, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. The Gentiles will hope in him. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul's telling us how to live in the kingdom right now, and he's talking to believers, to the body of Christ, to the church. And what he's saying is that we live in peace with each other that Gentiles, and this is a multi-ethnic group of people. If you were not Jewish, you were Gentile. And so the Gentiles, we 
are recipients of the promise made to Abraham that all the peoples on the earth will be blessed by you. This multi-ethnic people redeemed by Jesus, the Prince of Peace, are called to live in peace with each other. I think it's interesting that Paul over and over quotes the prophets when he's talking about um, the Gentiles praising the Lord, the Gentiles being part of this family of God. That's us. And what he says to us is that we live in peace with each other. And so the challenge to us today, I think, is to think about the ways that we within the body have separated ourselves from each other and the things that have broken our peace and the ways that um, we don't walk in harmony with each other. Where have cultural differences, hostilities, political differences, prejudice separated us from others in the church? Where have we been slow to forgive? And look at the language Paul uses there. Endurance and encouragement. He's not saying this is an easy thing. But that the God of hope gives us the strength to do it. If we are where the kingdom of God is, to walk in peace with each other, with other believers, is a primary evidence that we are living in the kingdom. And so we're challenged with that. We're also pointed to the scripture to be encouraged in this, to read and remember what the promises are. He started out with uh, those things written in the past were for us, for our encouragement, for our instruction. So we go back and we read the Old Testament. We read the stories of the promise. We read the stories of God's people being unfaithful, but being drawn back by a merciful God over and over and over into relationship, into faithful relationship with him. We read that and we remember and we look at each other and we remember we are called to peace within the body of Christ. We are called to walk together. We are called to reflect the kingdom to the world who's counting down the days till Christmas, shopping days till Christmas, to reflect this other way of life, this upside down way of life. It doesn't look like outside of the kingdom, we expect it to look. And now we go to our gospel. And y'all, if this had not been the lectionary section for today, it would not have been my choice. I'm just telling you. And that's the good thing about the lectionary. It, it forces us sometimes to teach and preach on things that we well, just slip around otherwise. So we're going to go to Matthew. Do we have it there? To chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to John the Baptist. Not John the Baptist, the sweet little baby in Elizabeth who leaps with joy when Mary shows up. We like that John the Baptist on Christmas Eve, kind of around there, right? But to fully appreciate Christmas, the incarnation of Christ, we need to talk about John the Baptist, the man. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah who said, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? 
Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children from, for Abraham from these stones. The ax is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Merry Christmas. <laughs> but John's voice is important. We have to hear that today on this Sunday of peace. Because peace comes through repentance. He has called us to repentance. This life with God is an interactive life. And the more we interact with him, the more we are formed into who he has created us to be. And part of that interaction is confession and repentance. John starts off here, John's kind of an odd guy. Like most of the prophets, I think. It just tells us in those days, He's coming from the wilderness, which is where prophets would spend time. He comes from the wilderness, and he's baptizing people into repentance, into a confession of their sin. We don't have any idea what he said, but did you see the, the description of, of how many? I mean, all the people of Jerusalem, all the people of Judea, all the people of the region of the Jordan, something he was saying was touching them, that need for repentance, that need for confession struck a deep chord. And he was baptizing. He was welcoming them and baptizing them. And he doesn't get harsh until the church folk show up. The religious leaders, the people who knew all the rules, they made a lot of the rules that they were having other people follow. And it says they, they came to his baptism. Something drew them there. Were they coming to be baptized as well? Was it perhaps, uh, well, let's just add this on. We see the response. Was, there, was it a draw in their hearts? But John is really, really straightforward with them and calls them to repentance, to bear fruit of repentance. And he uses language that makes it clear that those things that are not fruitful, that are not fruit of repentance, repentance will not last. He uses language like the chaff burning and eternal fire. Those things that are not of the kingdom of God will not last. And if we are attached to them and guided by them and love them, we need to repent. We are called to repentance. The peace of God comes when we turn to him, confess our sin, repent, we change our minds about the choices we've made. And we do differently from that point on. I quoted Fleming Rutledge a minute ago. I'm going to say something else that she wrote. Every step we take in this world is a step toward either darkness or light. Every harsh word, every mean act, every vengeful thought is part of the works of darkness. Every act of forgiveness, every small act of charity, every temptation resisted is a piece of the armor of light. 
She also wrote, the whole structure of the gospel is founded and built upon the lordship of the crucified, risen, victorious Christ, who is able to make his servant stand and not fall. In the same way that uh, John said to the church folks, you can't just add this to the rules. It can't just be something else you add on to your everyday normal American Christian life. To embrace the coming king requires repentance, and that will bring a whole new orientation toward the world. The working out of God's purposes in our lives takes the entirety of our lives. And so this is a process as the Holy Spirit shines light into us and we see those places that we had not wanted to admit to or look at or acknowledge that need to be offered up to God to be confessed and repented of. We do that because we're living in the kingdom. And for those of us in the kingdom, the gospel makes us to stand and not fall. To be able to do that, our repentance is our participation in the work of God in us. Our repentance opens the door to God's peace. So where is the message of peace in this, in Isaiah, in the letter to the Romans? into John the Baptist facing off with the, the religious. It's in the crucified, risen, victorious Christ. That is where our peace is. It is in the Father who so loves you. It's in the Holy Spirit who abides in you, who is your encouragement and your comfort. And peace is to be lived out in the kingdom of God where you stand until Jesus comes again. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We come to the table every week. And every week we begin with a prayer of repentance. I am going to invite you today, we're going to say it again today, but I'm going to invite you to take that prayer with you as you go and to return to it this week in your prayer time when you have a moment of quiet. Return to that prayer and ask the loving, gracious Holy Spirit to show you the thing that needs to be repented of in your heart. The thing about us, as we've lived this, this life for a while, we get really good at camouflaging those things, sometimes even from ourselves, certainly from each other. But the Father who loves you, the Spirit who dwells in you, will gently show you these and invite you by the outstretched arms of Christ on the cross to give that over to him. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave th thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I think also when we come to the table, he says we remember, I mean, we think about what Christ has done, but we are also remembered. We are put back together. We confess our sin and we come to the table and we are put back together. Would you stand with me and pray this prayer? 
Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, set up your kingdom in our midst. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, renew me and all of the world. The table of the Lord is open. Would our servers come down and we will also have prayer partners. If, um, if there's something you'd like to pray about, something in this, this message pricked your heart. You are welcome at the table of the Lord. <laughs>